1913, a young man, 33, stands in the midst of ranch land by a creek. The expanse is flat and wide, protected by hills. He squints eastward, eight miles to the rapidly growing city center, downtown Los Angeles. The smell of sagebrush in the air, he turns westward, facing the breeze, staring across another expanse toward the popular amusements of Venice of America and the Pacific Ocean. Young Harry Culver breathes deeply. It's 1913. Harry Culver is standing in front of a group of his peers at the California Club in Los Angeles and announces his intention and his dream to build a new city, a balanced community split between business and residential components, halfway between Abbott Kinney's Resort of Venice and Los Angeles, a bustling community. But Harry knew his city needed more than just the right location. It needed a heartbeat, excited, energetic, attractive to the outside world, and he knew just where to find it. The film business had left the harsh seasons of New York migrating to Southern California, and young Harry envisioned it as the linchpin of what he'd call Culver City. A few years before, Harry Culver was in the area that was to become Culver City, and he saw Thomas H. Entz shooting a movie on Bayona Creek. He convinced him to bring over his thriving operation. The next major studio in Culver City was also established by Thomas Entz down the street in 1918. Soon after came Hal Roach, whose Laugh Factory to the World featured headliners such as Laurel and Hardy and the Little Rascals. These production houses brought employees and crews which led to the businesses needed to serve them, from restaurants and watering holes to services such as florists and plumbers, hardware stores to hotels, soon including the iconic Culver Hotel. Harry creatively marketed to families a temperate location with affordable land where they could live and work nearby. He emphasized fitness, sponsoring marathons, bicycle races, horse riding, park space. He bussed people in for a free lunch and even gave a lot on which to build a house away in his prettiest baby contest. Public services soon included police, fire, postal, and schools. In studios became Metro Goldwyn Mayer, and in the next quarter century, such stars as Clark Gable, Judy Garland, Spencer Tracy, Joan Crawford, and Errol Flynn, even the Munchkins frequented the vibrant new city. The studios which created Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz built huge backlots where residents and visitors could peer down on Paris, New York, and the Old West. Just as Harry Culver had dreamt, Culver City grew as an oasis of residence and commerce, all with an underpinning of the joy of artistic expression, a community on top of modern technology and always fostering a creative environment. Harry Culver would be pleased today, I am sure. We have a wonderful community known for its parks, for its movie studios, for its creative element, and even our industrial track, the Hayden Track, a post-World War II development has transitioned into a haven for creative businesses. Today, the faces and many of the names have changed, but drive or walk around, stop in at local businesses, and you'll see that Culver City continues to thrive as envisioned by young Harry Culver as he stood at that lonely crossroads over a century ago. Would Harry Culver be proud of what his city has become? There's no question. Even with modern transportation and communication, Culver City has developed just as Harry hoped. It's still an oasis between downtown Los Angeles and the ocean. As from the beginning, Culver City continues as a dynamic, substantial, creative community in keeping with the prophetic vision of its founder. Culver City, with a smile on its face, a camera in its hands, and still driven with the heart of a lion, is poised to leap into its next hundred years. <laughs>